Hi, I'm Dr. Christopher Newman. I'm Professor of Space Law and Policy at the University of Northumbria in Newcastle in the United Kingdom. I'm also International Space Law Advisor for Cold Star Technologies. I listen to the Cold Star Project. This show is for entertainment purposes only and is not what is termed professional advice. The Cold Star Project is proudly presented by the Operational Excellence Society. Cold Star Tech is a supporter of the OPEX Society, and Jason Canigan is a member of its board of advisors. Talk with us at Cold Star Tech to find out what we can achieve together with your Lean Six Sigma or Operational Excellence programs. And check out opexsociety.org to learn more. Welcome back to the Cold Star Project. Our guest today is Glenn Powder Carlson. I want him on because he was the president of the Association of Old Crows at the time, which I've been a member of for a year or more, and so is my assistant Maya. Uh, and we fully support them. It's an electronic warfare group. And Glenn has this amazing history, uh, 20 years plus in the Air Force, uh, first as a, a captain and instructor, teaching people about electronic warfare, uh, graduating up to teach officers on things like war theory and conflict resolution. And uh, then as a lieutenant colonel running the second bomber wings uh inspections plans weapons and tactics division i mean this is this is some great stuff here uh, and finally uh really understanding what airborne electronic attack systems require all right what is actually necessary since then he's worked in private industry uh, for a number of years now he's been a senior principal systems engineer at bae systems leading a team of 50 50 engineers uh, I'll bet <laughs> if he has a chance to watch my uh, discussion with Paul Rokins, he'll uh, have some laughs and insights about uh, managing smart people because I'm sure he manages a heck of a lot of them. And he was the president of the Association of Old Crows International for a couple of years, 2020 through 2022, and is a lifetime member. I mean, he's been a member of the AOC for. <laughs> 37 years, all right? So I really wanted Glenn on to learn more about electronic warfare, the state of the situation where we're at, and also uh, what he's learned about promoting the Association of Old Crows because a lot of good things have happened uh, while he was in there. The president of the thing, uh, in particular, I've enjoyed the Journal of Electromagnetic Dominance, their uh, publication that comes out monthly, and so does my my assistant, so I get to hear about it, because <laughs> she tells me things. So, anyway, let's have Glenn on. Glenn, welcome. All right, Glenn. So let's begin with this. How did the Association of Old Crows get started? It's been a little while. It has been. Um, in fact, next year will be 60 years for we'll have our 60th wow. symposium. Um, but it was started back in 19, was it 63, uh, with World War II veterans. Mm. Um, and that was the key there was that basically electronic warfare started its use really in the Battle of Britain mm -hmm. and also in the U.S. and Allied raids over Europe. And those countermeasure operators um, were ravens and they employed chaff transmitters receivers and things like that to get onto those frequencies that either the bombers had or other radars had um later that term raven was changed into crows mm. and then so about 20 plus years or 20 years or so after world war ii this group of crows uh, decided that they wanted to have a reunion. And so they got together and they started to meet and it became an annual reunion and they created the Association of Old Crows because at that point, 20 years after World War II, they consider themselves old crows. And <laughs> that's pretty much where our heritage comes from. Um, and so, yeah, you know, it's World War II and we also have an awful lot, obviously, from uh, the Vietnam era and whatnot, and then more recently through any of the other conflicts uh, right now, so. Right, right. I found it fascinating, and, and folks, uh, if you haven't gone and listened to the Captain Bruce Gordon uh, episodes, I did two with him. He's an electronic warfare instructor and fighter pilot. Um, he's 80-something years old, and he actually <laughs> met um, Jones, Reginald Jones, uh, in the 70s who <laughs> came over from England. Uh, uh, I mean, the story of the Battle of the Beams, don't take my word for it. Go and read the Wikipedia article on the Battle of the Beams. It is more exciting than any feature film. <laughs> Plot turns and twists and stuff like that. It's really, really fun. Uh, and then I think in the second episode, we got more into the electromagnetic spectrum and the measures, countermeasures, cat game um, that 
members of the Association of Old Crows uh, get into. I'm proud to be a member uh, myself, and uh, I also got my assistant Maya <laughs> to sign up. So that's been that's been great. Um, so tell us about. I'm going to ask about you personally in a second, but let's keep that separate uh, for now. What is the mission of the association and how has that morphed over the years? Well, the, the mission of the association is to be an organization and it's a professional organization. You know, it started out more fraternal, obviously, with those vets, um, but we become a professional organization and the folks who have common interests in electronic warfare, electromagnetic spectrum operations or EMSO, um, the Army Cyber Electromagnetic Activities, SEMA and Information Ops. Yes, it is uh, sort of an acronym soup, um, mm -hmm. but the, the primary thing is electronic warfare, uh, spectrum operations and things that occur within those and to include information ops, directed energy. Um, but it is to network uh, folks, not just in the military. I mean, that was the focus, but one of the things we've been trying to do is open up that aperture. Um, but we have, we work with um, governments. So like we work with the U.S. Congress uh, to educate our congressmen and women hmm. um, and their staffs on EW and spectrum operations, uh, defense, obviously, industry. And of course, we are a global organization. We've got over 14,000 members and about a third of those are international and about the same with our industry partners. So, um, but again, it's a a focused area for folks to network, to meet, to um, get for education, um, just, you know, just to chat about different things. Mm -hmm. uh, primarily in the unclass, we do have some classified conferences and whatnot, because uh, in this realm, you can get into that pretty quick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, indeed. So, yeah, uh, and one of the things that I liked the most um, on becoming a member is there's a, a forum and sort of information inside the website. You log in and there's a lot more there um, than just a member's list. I'm, I'm sure we would all wish people used this thing more. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but uh, but it's there, you know. Um, in, the, in the picture behind you, Yes, um, we've got a number of elements sort of rotating or <laughs> flying around the AOC <laughs> logo. Um, tell us a bit about them, I guess, just whatever you can think of. Well, um, it, this goes back to our core in support of our members and support of our chapters, because, um, again, we have local chapters around the globe as well. Uh, actually, like 70, 71 chapters around the globe. Um, but as you can see in there, we have webinars. Um, so. We, we have online and in webinars, we have in-person classes. Um, we are very much um, building our STEM program and our scholarship programs through our educational foundation. Uh, we have the JED, the Journal of Electromagnetic Dominance, um, and that's our monthly issue. And there's typically an EW class in there that Dave Adamy has written about and whatnot. Um, there's links to our conferences, both regional and uh, like our international symposium that'll be coming up in October. Um, we do have career centers. We have uh, membership chats. Um, you can link up with those local chapters. We have an awards program. So there's all sorts of different uh, areas that you can go and find information and either provide additional information or ask questions and that, you know, for us to answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, lots of lots of goodies. And we'll get into Jed in a minute. Uh, I will say that Jed is one of the few industry magazines that Maya, my assistant, says she reads every month. We just talked about it a week or so ago. So that's that's good. That's good to get attention share. Right. Uh, it's, it's really good. All right, Glenn, your personal background. Let's talk about that and how you joined the old crows. Oh, man, it's been over 36 years. Um, I actually didn't really know about the Crows. Um, I was had finished up undergraduate, undergraduate navigator school and training and had elected to go into the electronic warfare side. Um, I had a double E degree and thought, gee, an electrical engineer, electronic warfare, maybe there's a match and maybe I can 
make a decent career or something out of the Air Force with it. Um, so during EW school, uh, they have a number of programs and awards, and I happen to uh, have the top score in the simulators, and that um, was the Old Crow Award. And so with that, I got a little plaque, and I got a membership in 1986 for the old crows and pretty much the rest is history um however my inf obviously my engagement in the crows has changed over the years <laughs> right right yeah so how did you evolve i mean you became its president and you've been 36 years of being the company fair the organization president right it's, we'll get into that as yeah. well but uh, how did you get there um well, I just I became very passionate about electronic warfare. As you mentioned earlier, it is very much a chess game with moves and counter moves. Right. Um, and I got very intrigued on how, you know, various platforms, various systems, capabilities would work against others and how, again, that chess game went continued on. Um, but for my involvement with the Crows really began uh, when I was doing engineering and test when the Bomber Reprogramming Center was at Offutt Air Force Base in Nebraska um, under Strategic Air Command and then Air Combat Command before moving to Eglin Air Force Base. And I got involved in the local chapter there um, with helping run a local conference, getting on that board of directors and dabbled in a little bit of other boards as my military career took me around the United States. And basically, oh, about nine years ago, uh, one of the past presidents, Dave Heim, was on the nominations and elections committee. And he goes, Powder, we need you. To, he goes, I need you to run. And I'm like, no, I'm not the right guy. I'm, I'm not a board of directors person. And finally, I acquiesced and said, OK, fine, I'll run. I won't get elected. And then that'll be the end of it. <laughs> you guys could be quiet about all this. Yeah. <laughs> and. Uh, ended up, I got elected. So I ended up on the, I was um, elected to the board, have served, been serving on the board since um, in various roles and whatnot. And then, um, you know, a couple of years ago, elected to run for president, was uh, fortunate and honored to be elected by the membership. And my term will finish up here in about two months now. Mm. Uh, I'll be turning the reins over. Okay. What's your personal mission? So independent of, of AOC um, or maybe guiding AOC, what's been your, your mission? One thing, uh, actually, there's a couple things. One is STEM, um, our Young Crow program. That is core to what, because I'm literally an old crow. Um, so, but it's our Young Crows who are going to take this organization into the future. Um, and so it's imperative that we engage with them, find out what um, gets them involved and excited in an organization and especially professional organizations. Um, so that's one piece. Uh, the other is, is just spectrum and the spec and operations within spectrum in general, uh, the general population. Uh, one of the things I've been trying to focus on is that it's not just the military, it's mm. commercial, it's civilian. Um, and we've seen that very much in the uh, Ukrainian Russian war, mm. um, you know, where citizens have gotten involved using drones, using social media, um, using their radios. All of that uses the spectrum. You and I in this uh, web, this webcast uh, it, or podcast, this is using the spectrum. We use it every day. We use it with our cars. We use it with our cell phones. Um, and if you take it away, you know, what happens when somebody can't use their cell phone? Um, if they go into a dead zone um, and is that dead zone, is that really a dead zone or did somebody else make it a dead zone? So awareness of, you know, spectrum operations and what people and how our day-to-day -day lives really are pivot you know it's pivotal to our daily lives uh, especially you know i look at new kitchen appliances mm. you know your tv yeah. um connecting to the web you know i can turn my stove on you know via an app uh you know i can set the temperature in my house via an app but that's using spectrum and and folks are starting to see more of that but yeah mm. it's much much bigger than just the military side and of course the military scene uh, grows uh, constraints on its availability of spectrum out there. 
Right. Yeah. Cause there's only so much. <laughs> so how, how are you staying energized and sharp after 36 years of being involved? Um, just again, um, being able to interact with folks who are unaware mm -hmm. of what the crows do, mm -hmm. um, young folks, young engineers, junior engineers, um, folks that are just curious, um, mm -hmm. that curiosity, I just, that feeds what I was curious about electronic warfare 36 years ago. And it's also one of those things too, that I can learn from those junior engineers, those younger folks, as much as they can learn from me, I get to learn from them. And you also get to, to figure out that, you know, the physics is the physics and that hasn't changed. Um, one thing I've, when I was at the 513th in Omaha that I mentioned before, when we were moving that squadron to Eglin, mm. there were artifacts in my desk that had been left there by previous owners. One of which was a Air Force electronic warfare pamphlet from the seventies, from actually wow. 1972. <laughs> and you can open it up and the principles are still the same. Mm. They haven't changed. The physics is the physics. And when you show that to other folks, it's like, wow, this is pretty cool. And especially when it's an old and yellowed uh, mm. <laughs> pamphlet and paper, uh, you know, they get a kick out of it. You get a kick out of uh, engaging with them on it. And then their new ideas that they have of how to fight and how to operate in this uh, domain, mm -hmm. as I call it. <laughs> There's, there's a yeah, a lot of layers, a lot going on, folks. If this is a new topic to you, again, I, I've got, I have to correct myself. Bruce Gordon was actually a, a major, not a captain, <laughs> but also go find Steve Blank's history of um, of electronic warfare and uh, it, secret history of Silicon Valley. It'll be on YouTube. Uh, if you message me and you say, I want the slide deck, I'm sure I've got a short link somewhere to the slide deck. That thing is amazing. Starting with the German big radar stations, they're, they're enormous, right? Uh, and, and coming all the way through the 50s when they started commercializing, it should be called Microwave Valley. Uh, and that whole story, boy, it's, it's really something. And uh, it'll give you a great platform or a great basic uh, foundation of understanding of what we're talking about here and why this is so important. Um, I had seen a quote from a deputy director of defense for, for EW a few years back now that there had been kind of a lag in EW development for about 20 years. Uh, and I'm curious about your opinion on that. Um, oh, there's no doubt. Uh, basically, the Department of Defense, it's not it wasn't just an Air Force, Navy, Army thing. The Department of Defense um, let electronic warfare atrophy for two and a half decades. Hmm. And I guess that's been one of the, those other things that's motivated me because I saw the damage that was done because of it. And while we have electronic warfare programs today that are state of the art and bringing new capabilities to the warfighter. Um, basically the DOD bit on the low observable or stealth uh, capability. And that is electronic warfare. Don't get me wrong. And it's a great capability, but it is not a silver bullet that solves everything as we have seen. Um, you know, there are stealth can be countered. And so what is the counter to that? So that's when you see capabilities being included on F-22s, F-35s and whatnot. Um, that's now recognized. So, but in the meantime, things like, you know, F-15s, 16s, A-10s, B-52s, B-1s, a lot of the, in F-18s, a lot of those electronic warfare suites were neglected and sorely neglected for decades. And everybody, and you know, I come from the B-52 community. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my first flight in the B-52 in 1986, the airplane was gonna be gone, you know, within 10 years, within five years, and it just keeps getting extended. And now we're looking <laughs> at that's going out. It'll probably see its centennial, but all those aircraft, um, those systems were neglected. And now we realize that we still need those legacy platforms because we need that. We're not going to just fight in a low observable environment. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Stealth aircraft can't do everything. Correct. But, <laughs> and, and they're extremely expensive. So we only get a few. Right. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, all right. Well, I think it's a good transition to talk about JET, the Journal of Electromagnetic Dominance. Um, how did that come about? I mean, you know, when when you're running an organization, you have limited resources and you have to choose, right? What what are we going to do here? Are we going to try and create uh, some kind of advertising revenue stream and the ability to editorialize or spend the money somewhere else? So how did JED come about and, and what's its purpose? Um, well, the JED came about, well, it was before I actually came in onto the scene and was a member and whatnot, but it was a way to get information to the membership. Um, okay. And it was also been a way to generate uh, dollars and whatnot to keep, you know, got to keep oh. things running. <laughs> um, you keep know, the spectrum on. There we are. <laughs> there we go. You know, we do, we do have a paid staff, but like the entire board is all volunteers. Most of it's that, but the JED, mm -hmm. um, is a great conduit to provide information and what's going on out in the spectrum. You know, what is industry doing? What are some of the contracts that are out there? What is, you know, Defense Department looking to do? What is Congress looking to do? Um, it is more obviously U.S. focused. Um, we do try to do, in fact, I think in a month or two, we're going to have um, for the Royal Air Force, uh, there should be an article in the JED for that. So we're mm. trying to incorporate more of that. But it is, it's a way to get the word out. Um, you know, it's a great reference. It has lists different uh, technologies of chips, of antennas, of actual EW equipment that's actually on aircraft and whatnot. Mm. And it's become, you know, basically a good professional journal uh, where we can, you know, spread that news and whatnot out there. And Naylor has been a good partner with us for that. Okay. Uh, do you have any involvement with it in your role? Um, I write a monthly message. So okay. uh, basically <laughs> yeah. everybody gets to, gets to, you know, get an opportunity if they so desire to uh, see my, see my mug on the, at the top of it and then see what is um, the, it, what topics have been interesting to me that I want to highlight to the membership and whatnot. Okay. I, I like that it's there to serve the membership. Um, what is the feedback loop like? How do you know if you're doing a good job with Jed? Um, well, for one, as long as if our sponsors are continuing to buy mm -hmm. um, the, the, their ad space and whatnot, you know, the back cover yeah. uh, ads throughout the magazine, then, you know, obvious, then that's one indicator. Okay. Two is feedback from members. Um, you know, sometimes they'll email direct to either Naylor or, or to John Knowles or myself. Hey, you know, we thought this was good. And hey, can you expand on this or something in the future? Um, but it's, it's typically, yeah, it, it's one is the members or those who are reading it. Uh, sometimes it's informal. So like, folks at work where I am, they'll come, Hey, I like that. You know, Hey, this is a neat article or this was a neat, um, you know, EW 101 in the back was really good and it helps. So, but sponsorship I think is the biggest because that means the industry partners still want to in invest in it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Where now y'all know that this is not a pitch fest in here, but I'm going to ask anyway, <laughs> because I like to support <laughs> my friends. How, how, and where should should sponsors or people wanting to be sponsors um, communicate and connect with you guys? Where should they um, go? They should come come to our staff. Um, okay. If you go to crows.org and you go click on the about uh, tab and look at the staff, Sean Fitzgerald is one on our marketing side and Rally Levitt is, she's another one. Um, you know, you can just, folks can just send you know, something to the staff or whatever, and we'll make sure it gets to the right place. Okay. Um, we've, I've got an, I've got an awesome staff. I, I can't say enough about the staff that uh, we have on board for good. the AOC. Good, good. Yeah. I love getting a plug in for staff. <laughs> because always, they always are unsung heroes. Yes, they um, are. <laughs> we've got, we've got a note in here from you in, in the uh, Google doc that says, what was the first event with jamming and capital J? And so tell me about that question. What, what are we, what are we talking about here? Well, this goes, this goes back to some of my emphasis of about being the civilian commercial side. Okay. One would, one would think that the first electronic attack, shall I say, would have been military to military, but it wasn't. Mm. Um, and folks can read about it in our history of EW, Vol. 1 by Alfred Price, but 
actually, it was back in 1901 during the America's Cup. Okay. <laughs> um, the American Wireless Telephone and Telegraph um, had they were trying to get in on reporting on the America's cup. And at that point it was pretty much teletype and, you know, Morse code type things. Mm -hmm. And basically they, the industry, the reporters said they figured out, okay, if we have used a uh, one 10 second dash, then that would mean the American yacht Columbia was in the lead. Two 10 second dashes was Shamrock two. The British yacht was in the lead and three would mean that they were, tied um well the the company that didn't the american wireless telephone and telegraph um did, who didn't get the contract they could get real-time status but they could cover that and so basically their signal jammed the other press agency's ability to report on the race and so it was simple mm -hmm. easy but effective yeah. and it put them out in front of the ability to get the news out first. Interesting. A couple other, I love history. I love how we got to where we are now. That's a, that's a very important question for me. And uh, that's a fun part of it. That's even before the, the Russo-Japanese war. Yes. Uh, where, there was some, <laughs> where there was a little bit of that going on and then the Russians communicating openly yeah. and the Japanese going, thank you. <laughs> yeah, and that, that was really, really yeah. the first military yeah. use of it was that, but mm -hmm. so... Yeah, there's a there's a fun story. Oh boy, I wish I remember the details right now. But of uh, two groups working on this was in World War Two, I think. Uh, two groups working on electronic uh, warfare transmission, and uh, they didn't know about each other. And every so often, the one group would get jammed, and they, <laughs> what the heck's going on here? You know, and it turned out it was the other university or whatever across town <laughs> was working. Uh, on the same thing so we we kind of touched on this a little bit earlier but <laughs> let's let's ask it again so that you can give a really um succinct a direct answer to it what impact does the aoc have that's likely out of the public eye um one of the things i would say the biggest thing is is being it advocating electronic warfare and spectrum capabilities um to Congress in educating uh, the, the Congress and the staffers. Um, it's typically not well known. We do not, you know, bump up programs or, you know, we don't say, hey, you should, you should fund this program. Okay. We focus in, hey, the, the services need this capability. Mm -hmm. Whatever program brings it, I, we, we don't care, <laughs> yeah. but we do know what, because of the, a lot of our membership being former veterans and a lot of us former EWOs, yeah. we, we know what the capabilities are that are needed out there um, and investment, you know, in technology so that then we can realize new uh, capabilities in the future as well. But that's probably one of the biggest things is that um, working with the con you know act, you know having congress actually come to us in the electronic warfare wor working group which i think is the old name and i don't remember the new one uh but those um those folks there's not a lot of knowledge there so they they're they're craving knowledge and whatnot so and it's a di it gives them a different flavor than just your the defense primes mm -hmm. or, you know, the larger defense companies or even the smaller or midsize defense companies. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Because you guys don't have an agenda to push product basically. <laughs> right. <laughs> Specific no. time, you know, Hey, we're good at this, but you guys should buy more of it. Um, and, and yeah, and I can understand legislative assistance and, and that Senator assistance and that yep. not having the time to be involved. I mean, I know my own knowledge uh, of this field, it was nothing five years ago right and uh, and i really had to study and go find books and read them and uh, and build up right to and and find people to interview <laughs> to, to really get educated and if, if that's not your focus you're just not going to hear too much about this stuff so it's good that uh, aoc is, is there um recommending certain kinds of technologies and that uh, let's finish up with this, Glenn. What does the AOC yeah. offer its members and who can join? 
Well, anybody can join. And that's one of the things that uh, messages that we definitely try to get out. I, I even with engineers that I work with, it's like, well, I'm not an EWO. I can't right. join the Crows. It's like, oh, yes, you can. <laughs> um, anyone can join the Crows. Um, we all use the spectrum and that's key. Uh, so, you know, some of the things that we offer, we have podcasts. We have one set of podcasts that goes for current technology. We have another set of podcasts that talk about the history of EW. Um, as I mentioned before, we have webinars. Um, we have uh, actual in, in-person academic classes. Um, and as a member, you have access to all of those recordings. You don't have to be a member to see a webinar live. Um, you can just, you can sign up. Um, and we have notices that go out um, and we have sponsors for those. And it's, you know, it's, it's a good way for folks to see some of what we're doing, but, you know, some basic um, electronics courses, um, you know, on, on gate arrays, on antennas, maybe not EW specific, or it could be EW specific, um, but classes like that. Um, we offer networking. We have a mentor program. Uh, we are developing a certification program so that folks can be certified in uh, the spectrum operations. Um, we have scholarship programs. Um, we have one uh, that Raytheon graciously donates $25,000 a year to the Educational Foundation, and we give out two scholarships every year to uh, STEM students. Um, and then our local chapters give um, hundreds of thousands of dollars as well um, out to local STEM uh, students and whatnot. Uh, so there's those opportunities, especially for those in school, um, and STEM programs, um, chapters are working to develop their own uh, STEM programs. We have core materials within the organization, um, but those are some of those things that we've got out there for the members, you know, as well as, uh, you know, for me, it's been a lot of networking. Uh, I've met an awful lot of folks through this organization and get to see them. And it's always good to see them around the globe. Yeah, I'm just looking up the crows website <laughs> i think you mentioned it crows.org crows.org yeah um just to direct people to go there and also now glenn let's finish up with this who do you want to meet who who would you like to reach out to you personally uh and how should they contact you what's the best way for them to do that um well i guess anyone who's entered in spectrum ops uh but also you know i've got a lot of network and links within the defense uh, industry and um, former veterans and, and current active duty folks, uh, but trying to reach out more to that commercial civilian side. So, you know, those folks that uh, at AT&T, T-Mobile, you know, I mean, using the frequencies that they do occasionally we get inter you know electromagnetic interference between systems mm -hmm. you know so bluetooth doesn't work right in your car cuz i have too many different frequencies going on within the house um but they are free to reach out to um anyone you know email if you go to crows.org, uh, you can email folks uh, that are on the board of directors or board of governors, as well as the staff or myself. Um, the easy one for me is mine. It's carlson at crows.org is my email. Um, so folks are welcome to reach out at any time. Um, I do tr check it daily. So um, I do have a day job that's full time, but I also, you know, being president, I, I know I've got my responsibilities here too. Excellent. Well, thank you, Glenn, for taking the time to do this. Oh, my pleasure. Had fun. I did too. All right. Let's thank Glenn for coming on and telling us about the Association of Old Crows and a little bit about electronic warfare. If you have a chance, go and check out the AOC website, see if it's for you. And I highly recommend being a member. It's one of the associations that I feel really strongly about. Now, if you're listening and you're a defense contractor president and you want to improve your bid capture results, Come and talk to us at Cold Star Tech. This is a major thing that we help people out with. There are whole areas uh, that people <laughs> maybe haven't even thought of or think they're doing, and they're doing not as good of a job at it as they could. And uh, also there are some very innovative 
ways of getting attention, expressing your value proposition, and getting the buyer to understand and believe in you in a way that uh, other people just aren't even trying to do. They, they're not even thinking of these things. So go to coldstartech.com and book an appointment to speak with me or just go and find me on LinkedIn, Jason Canigan, and uh, shoot me a direct message and we'll take it from there. Talk to you soon.